Now on Talking Solutions with the Nevada State Legislature is only in session every other year, but this happens to have been one of those years. And they got quite a lot of work done. Just want to give you a quick recap of some things as voters we need to know. Will Batista, you've got to do with Marcy's Law. Welcome back. Thank you for having me again. You were in several months ago talking about Marcy's Law, which my little one sentence explanation would be that it is rights for victims of crime. Because certainly the criminals that are being tried innocent until proven guilty and all of that. They have rights, but so should the people who are the victims of crime. And that's, in a nutshell, what Marcy's Law is about. I know it was up in Carson City before the Nevada State Legislature. And from everything I heard, it passed. So are we good to go now? Yes and no. Just to summarize, Marcy's Law is a constitutional initiative here in Nevada. We are seeking to amend the Nevada Constitution to add equal rights for victims of crime. And it's important to do that on the state constitution because we want to make sure that it's enforceable and that we do have a level playing field between those who commit the crimes and those who are the victims of such. So back in 2015, we passed the legislature, just to give you a quick summary. And then this last legislative session, we passed with just about 25 minutes left on the clock of the Nevada legislature. Whoa. Yeah. So because we are a constitutional amendment, it required that the legislature pass it twice in consecutive sessions, and then it goes to the ballot. So now that we have passed those two hurdles, we now go to the ballot in 2018 for the voters of the state of Nevada to decide whether Marcy's Law should be adopted into the Nevada Constitution. So now it's time for us as voters to say, put it into the Nevada State Constitution. That's right. And, you know, as I discussed with you last time around, we feel it's so important. Anybody can become a victim of crime at any point, regardless of who you are, where you live, what your political ideology is. This is really a bipartisan or even nonpartisan issue. And it's incredible the amount of support that we have gotten all across the state. We have people like Nevada Attorney General Adam Laxalt here in Clark County. We have District Attorney C. Wolfson. We have many of the county commissioners on board. You know, so we have members of law enforcement. We have elected officials, members of municipalities all across the state coming and saying, yeah, we need this. We need to ensure that victims have a voice in the criminal justice process system and that they're not just lost. You know, the great thing about it is during the testimony before the assembly legislative operations a few months ago, District Attorney Steve Wolfson did a great job of explaining how several of the offices across the state are already doing this, but we want to make sure that if it's happening 80% of the time or 90% of the time, that it's happening 100% of the time. We want to make sure that all victims of crime across the state are treated equally and that they feel that they've been treated fairly. Makes sense. It seems like something like Marcy's Law would be a unanimous call. Do you have anybody who says, ah, it's not needed, it's not necessary? Yeah, you know, we have some detractors who worry about what effect it's going to have on the criminal justice process. Marcy's Law has now passed in five other states. It started in California in 2008 and has subsequently been passed in Illinois in 2014. And this last election, 2016, it passed in Montana, North and South Dakota. You know, many of the detractors are concerned about what effect it's going to have on the court system. In the states where Marcy's Law is fully operational and up and running, there's no backlog. We don't seek to diminish the rights of any other individual in the criminal justice process. That's just not what this is about. This is about treating people fairly and making sure that they have rights observed in the Constitution. And it's like you were mentioning, Will, we're leveling the playing field. Yeah. Will Batista is with us today on Talking Solutions, Regional Director of Marcy's Law for All. And Will, you're mentioning that it's passed in several other states. So this is pretty much a great idea for people all across the country that victims of crimes should have the same rights. That is correct. Our efforts are now nationwide. Our national headquarters is here out of Las Vegas. And so it's important that Nevadans understand the importance of this on a daily basis as we're talking to people who share their stories, who have been victims of crime. We feel and we hear the need for this more and more every day. And we want to make sure that the voters of Nevada understand why this is necessary. Some of the provisions that are critical are the right to notification. You should be able to know 
when the offender is coming up for a plea bargain or when the case is starting trial. Those are provisions that are particularly important. You know, things such as the right to privacy. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, for example, we want to make sure that your information is protected so that the abuser cannot come back and try to hurt you again. Those are common sense things that we feel very strongly about and making sure that everyone is protected. At the end of the day, it's all about people and making sure that people are protected. When a criminal commits a crime and they're arrested, you know, they're read a number of rights right off the bat. We want to make sure that nobody forgets about the victims and the situation that they're left behind. And we want to make sure that they know what resources are available to them to help them through this difficult situation. They've already been through a traumatic incident. We want to make sure that we alleviate anything moving forward. It would be a true situation of adding insult to injury. Correct. And the phrase that you came up with a couple minutes ago, Will, common sense, that's what Marcy's Law seems like to me. Of course, that's just personal opinion, (laughs) but it sounds like most other people that you are coming across also agree that this is important, that crime victims should have rights as well. Yeah, we've spoken to lots of advocacy organizations across the state, and we have received the support and endorsement of almost all of them across the state. I would encourage voters to feel free to visit our website. You can go to nv.marcyslaw.us, and Marcy's is spelled M-A-R-S-Y-S-L-A-W. Visit our website, take a look at the collaboration video that we've put together with people all across the state, advocates, like I mentioned earlier, elected officials who really feel the need for this. It's one thing for us to talk about it in the abstract, but it's different if you've been a victim of crime or if you know somebody who has been a victim of crime. And something that we definitely encourage people to do, if you want to get involved, first and foremost, of course, you can visit our website, visit us on Facebook, it's Marcy's Law for Nevada, or follow us on Twitter as well. You know, at the end of the day, the best way for voters to understand that and the need for Marcy's Law is to be able to tell victim stories. And it takes a lot. A lot of people deal with tragedy or traumatic incidents in different ways. And so it takes a lot for victims of crime to be willing to share their stories. But if you are willing, please feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us on social media or you can email me personally. My email address is will, W-I-L-L, at marcyslaw.us. And again, Marcy's Law is M-A-R-S-Y-S-L-A-W dot U-S. We'd love to be able to hear you out and hear about your situation and how Marcy's Law could have prevented some of these incidents from happening again. I'm going to have all of the links on our Talking Solutions Facebook page, plus, as always, podcast of our discussion today. Will Batista is with us talking about Marcy's Law. It's now passed through the Nevada State Legislature two different times. So it happened in 2015, happened again in 2017, just moments before it was not going to make it because they were coming down to the wire. (laughs) But now it's going to appear on a ballot question in November 2018. I love my little voters books going through and marking what I'm going to vote for before I ever go in. Every different ballot question has information inside the booklet. And I know exactly how they word it because I do it every time. Arguments for passage and arguments against passage. I think it will be interesting to see what they're going to come up with against passing this because it just makes sense. We want to make sure that voters out there understand that 2018 is going to be a very exciting year for Nevada, right? We have all of our constitutional officers up for election, our governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. We also have a federal race that's one of the most watched races in the country. Senator Heller is up for re-election. So that's going to take a lot of the attention for the upcoming 2018 November general election. But we want voters to maybe take a deeper dive and understand that some of the ballot questions, especially Marcy's Law, are important. And it's important because it will affect you in ways that you may not see today. Like I said, we never hope that anybody becomes a victim of crime, but you want to make sure that if you are a victim of crime, that you have provisions available in the Nevada State Constitution that protects your rights. And so, you know, even though there's going to be a lot of excitement about other races, I just want to make sure that the voters of Nevada understand that Marcy's Law as a constitutional ballot, even though it's a little bit further down on the ballot, please make sure to vote in favor of Marcy's Law. Make your voice be heard and help Nevada become one more state that has enforceable constitutional rights for victims of crime. 
And do understand, you won't be asked to vote on this until November of next year, well more than a year away. In the meantime, well, what do you do? Are you going to still be working on education on the importance of voting and making Marcy's Law a part of the Nevada State Constitution between now and then? Yeah, you know, one of the most important things that we can do, like you mentioned, is educate voters on what Marcy's Law is, what it's not, and what it is going to do once it's in place. So we will be at a number of different events. If your organization is throwing an event or if you want us to come and speak to you guys about what Marcy's Law is and how it would affect you and your community, please reach out to us. We would love to do that. But yeah, we will be out in the community at events, festivals, you know, interacting with voters and helping them have a clear understanding of what Marcy's Law is and why you should support it. We're going to continue to talk to our elected officials and make sure that we have as many people on board as possible. You know, if you have people from all across the state, from across party lines, white, black, doesn't matter who you are, this is important for everyone. It affects people all across the state of Nevada. And so that's our job to make sure that everybody is informed about what their rights are or what their rights could be under Marcy's Law. You know, well, as part of Talking Solutions, we always ask, what can we do to help you? There's a number of things your listeners can do. One, go onto our social media pages and like us, follow us, make sure to be engaged. Also, you know, help share some of the stories and some of the links that we put up on our Facebook pages and our website. I mentioned earlier, we always want to be able to hear from victims of crime as well for why this is a necessity. So if some of your listeners are a victim of crime, we would love for them to be able to share their story so that we can help educate voters a little bit better. We are not an advocacy organization, so I want to make sure that your listeners understand that. But we can point you to the right resources for those who have been victims of crime personally. Those are some of the most important things that you can do if you want to volunteer and help us by attending some of the festivals or hosting a group yourself. Please reach out to us. And of course, and most importantly, is in November of next year, we want your voters to vote yes on Marcy's Law. You should come and see us again before we get to the voting I would part be more than happy to do so. <laughs> I'd love that because I know we're well in advance of the November 2018 elections and you're entirely right, Will. There's going to be so much going on swirling around yeah. different issues and different people to vote for or against. And that's or- why I feel it's so important to come out and educate voters about this early on, right? Because everybody's going to be inundated with a bunch of political messages moving into next year. If we can get this message out early into the community, so that they understand it. When it comes time for voters to go to the ballot box, it'll be a refresher and say, oh yeah, I've heard about Marcy's Law. Oh yeah, you know, I do support victims of crime. I think that victims of crime do deserve basic equal rights under the Nevada Constitution. That's our goal is to get out ahead of this early on so that we don't have to compete with other messages that are out there. I made my decision up on this a long (laughs) time ago. So yes to Marcy's Law and that's what you're looking to achieve for people. Yes, ma'am. Well, is there anything I'm forgetting? We've covered everything your listeners need to understand, and hopefully your listeners are also voters, that we can't do this without your help. That's really what it comes down to. There are people out there who need this on the books. Think about them when you go to the ballot box. Some people believe that their vote doesn't really count for anything, but it certainly does, and especially in getting Marcy's Law added to the Nevada State Constitution. You've heard about it. I saw it all over Facebook for months. And I would imagine we're going to see some more of that as we approach the election. The legislature said yes to it in 2015, again in 2017, since they did that two sessions in a row. Now it's going to be a ballot question so that we can amend the Nevada State Constitution in November 2018. I don't see why anybody would vote against it. Neither do I. I try not to be one-sided in my approach to anything during our discussions, but it just seems like giving equal rights to crime victims is the right thing to do. Yeah, it just makes sense. Will Batista, you are the Nevada Political Director for Marcy's Law for All of Nevada. Thank you for coming back to visit us today on Talking Solutions. Thank you so much. Come see us before the election. I would be more than happy to. Pigs for the Kids Charity Barbecue Festival and Competition is Saturday, September 23rd at Craig Ranch Regional Park. Come join in on the fun. There's live music, awesome play area for the kids, and the best barbecue this side of the Mississippi. Tickets are available in advance for $10. Just go to pigsforthekids.org. All proceeds benefit Candlelighters Childhood Cancer Foundation, Cure for the Kids Foundation, and Nevada Childhood Cancer Foundation. Presented by the Lynn Ruffin-Smith Charitable Foundation and Best Time RV. 
Are you a wino? Maybe you prefer craft beer. Got time for a cocktail? Why not try all three at the beautiful Southern Highlands Golf Club? Come see, smell, sip, and savor at Sharpen Your Senses, a food and libations pairing featuring an executive chef, live entertainment, and the chance to win great prizes. September 30th from 6 to 9 p.m. All proceeds from this event go to Anson programs like the Piggy Bank Program and Anson Academics Homework Help and Tutoring. Get your tickets at anson.org slash events. That's A-N-D-S-O-N dot org slash events. Must be 21 or older. I'm Terry Springs. It's Talking Solutions. Right now we are recapping a few of the things that happened in this year's Nevada State Legislature, especially in the areas of energy. I want to welcome back our good friend Jennifer Taylor, our clean energy expert. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. And you are the state policy advisor for the Clean Energy Project? I am. I do state policy advising and consulting for Clean Energy Project as well as Advanced Energy Economy and some electric vehicle state policy advising as well. All good things. I love electric vehicles. Yes. Jennifer, it actually is the state legislature and what happened during this last session up in Carson City. That's what I'm curious to know about. What has happened with clean energy that will impact our lives as citizens of Southern Nevada? Well, we had an unbelievably energetic, no pun intended, (laughs) session for energy bills. There were 11 bills presented that really were going to impact Nevadans, how they used energy, how they could control their energy usage, what opportunities we would be able to provide to all Nevadans for accessing clean energy. Nine of those 11 bills passed. The two bills passed out of the legislature, but vetoed out of the governor's office. There are still issues that we're working on. I also serve on the governor's committee on energy choice, which if you'll remember from when we talked last year, the energy choice initiative was a ballot measure that would open up the market for consumer choice in their energy supply. He wanted to make sure that our committee worked on the two issues that he vetoed, which were renewable portfolio standard and community solar a little bit more as we headed into a second vote on that initiative to determine whether or not we would indeed have an open market for retail competition in energy supply. So let me just kind of run through some of these bills and let you know how they will have the ability to impact Nevadans. And I think the one that most people are going to be most interested in is Assembly Bill 405, the bill intended to fix rooftop solar and some of the issues that had arisen in 2015. 15 and early 2016 with the payback structure from the Public Utility Commission. You and I have talked about it a couple of times in Rooftop Solar and how oh, that's yeah. really been one of the driving forces behind a lot of the coverage and awareness and activism that we've seen in the clean energy sector. AB 405 was jointly sponsored by a whole host of fantastic legislators. And let me step back for a second and say that part of the reason we had such an amazing session legislatively was through the help of clean energy champion legislators like Assemblyman Chris Brooks, Senator Patricia Spearman, who's amazing, Senator Calvin Atkinson, who chaired the Senate Commerce, Labor and Energy Committee. But then we had some new legislators who were really eager to be part of this discussion on access to clean energy options and to energy efficiency for everybody. People like Assemblyman Justin Watkins, Assemblyman William McCurdy II, Assemblyman Ozzie Fumo, everybody who sat on the Assembly Commerce and Labor subcommittee. And we got a lot of bi- partisan support for these bills. AB 405, with a significant number of votes from the minority, also every single bill that came out of the legislature had bipartisan support in some way or another. This is really an issue that matters for Nevadans because it matters to our economy and to our economic opportunities. So if you are someone who thinks that you wanted to get rooftop solar and you thought, oh, I'm never going to be able to get rooftop solar. It's not going to pay back enough. It's not going to be a fair valuation of my solar. What AB 405 did was set rates for your credits on what you put into the grid if you get rooftop solar. Those rates are not one-to-one credit in, credit out like it used to be under the original system, but it is much closer to that and it's tiered. So you have two things. Your payback is going to be a percentage of retail as opposed to just a one-for-one. And as the rooftop market continues to grow, you will see smaller paybacks on those later installed systems. So this is a good opportunity if you've been holding back on getting rooftop to get a 
system put in place and lock in your rates now. The other thing that is really important for the rooftop solar discussion is that this bill, AB 405, set this rate structure. It also provided a series of statements about the rights of folks to generate, consume, and export their renewable energy to reduce their individual use of electricity and to be able to really take advantages of technologies as they move forward. That's great. But the other thing that's really important, and in my former life, as you know, Terry, I did construction defect, consumer protection work. Right. And when you have a company coming out to work on the largest investment in your life, you want to make sure that there's protections for you as a consumer, protections in the construction, protections in the contracting. And so 405 also sets forth a significant number of consumer protections and allows homeowners, consumers to be able to directly bring an action against their installers for violations of the provisions in this bill before a Deceptive Trade Practices Act violation could only be brought through the Attorney General. Now it can be brought directly by the consumer. Assembly Bill 405. Sounds like it had a lot of good things in it, especially for those of us who are interested in solar power for our homes. That's right. It really did. And the other thing that was really great about it, it was really a collaborative effort by all the stakeholders. And it was really a political priority to get this passed, to make sure that jobs could come back, to make sure folks could have the ability to get rooftop if they wanted to. And currently, there's also an implementing docket at the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada, which for those who really are interested in the wonky stuff, you can go to the PUCN website and look for docket number 17-07026. You can go back and look and see the discussion between the utility, solar advocates, and the commissioners on how 405 and its rate structure will be implemented for the public. And you know that, like always, I will put that information on the Talking Solutions Facebook page so that people aren't having to jot notes right now. It's like, where's my paper? Yeah, 405 was probably one of the key bills that we passed and signed. There were a couple of other bills related to access for more people to clean energy. Because even with rooftop solar, one of the concerns is that a huge number of rooftops and or homeowners can't get rooftop solar because they can't afford it. They don't have the credit to lease it. They don't have the proper orientation. They don't have enough efficiencies in their home. And there's debate about whether or not a lease for a rooftop system is really as good as being able to purchase it outright. There were some concerns about the lease model, I think, that led to some of the consumer protections and the contracting in AB 405. So what was also enacted were two things, the PACE bill and the Green Banks bill, Assembly Bill 5 and Senate Bill 407. Those bills both let structures be put into place to facilitate loans for investment in your property of clean energy systems like rooftop, like energy efficiency, those kinds of things where you may not have normally been able to have access because of your credit, because of your commercial building, super restrictive lending programs. Those bills are both in the implementation process as well. Green Banks is a really unique, innovative set of programs that only exist in a few other states, which again puts Nevada in a leadership position. That would allow residential folks to be able to access programs to increase efficiency and obtain clean energy upgrades to their homes. Yay! Yay! The governor is currently working on putting together the first Green Bank board. And then there's still work to be done on PACE implementation. And PACE sort of provides the same set of options for commercial owners as opposed to residential owners. Then we also had a good number of energy efficiency bills that came out to talk about energy efficiency programs to give direction to the Public Utility Commission to make sure that they were providing a broader view of how they approve energy efficiency programs so that it's not just a program by program cost effect effectiveness, but it's a portfolio of programs. And then the biggest piece of these two energy efficiency bills was the fact that they both seek carve outs of 5% of the program cost allocations to go directly to low income Nevadans. Because again, when you look at the disparity of who can access clean energy and clean energy investments, lower income folks spend a significantly larger proportion of their income on their energy usage as opposed to middle income and upper income. So they don't always have the opportunities to to afford the very things that could help them save on their energy bills. That's what these two energy efficiency programs that we're hoping will address. That's Assembly Bill 223, sponsored by Assembly McCurdy, and then Senate Bill 150, sponsored by Senator Pat Spearman. I like the fact that the last session of the Nevada State Legislature earlier this year, it sounds like they were doing a lot of work implementing things that will help us get more clean energy into our environment. They absolutely were. They did that because to a large extent, that's the vision and the direction
direction of the governor and the state's Office of Economic Development. There were also a couple of bills that came out of Governor Sandoval's new energy industry task force that had been convened in 16, Senate Bill 65, an integrated resource planning bill, which would essentially prioritize clean energy in the long-term planning process that's done by the PUC. There was also a planning bill that was Senate Bill 146, also from Senator Spearman, that would require the PUC to consider distributed energy resources like rooftop solar when they are doing that long-term planning. And then there were a couple of bills to talk about incentivizing storage because we know that storage is the next big frontier. Yes. We can put up as much solar as we want, but we can't run off of it. We can't run our homes and businesses and our computers and our phones and our TVs off of solar after the sun goes down or if there's an eclipse. And that actually had an impact. It did actually in some places. It was interesting because they did studies and they showed that the grid was actually able to manage and hold on to reliability despite the eclipse. So that's good to know that grid infrastructure has been taken into consideration as those kinds of phenomena happen. But storage really is going to allow us to take those intermittent resources like wind and solar and use them in the best way possible in terms of maintaining grid reliability, not overstressing our grids, not wasting those resources because we generate so much in the peak hours, but then it just goes nowhere because there's nowhere to hold it. So really working on incentivizing storage is going to be a fantastic thing. And those bills include Senate Bill 145 and Senate Bill 204. Both of those are going to be also at the PUC for work and implementation. That's kind of a quick roundup of some of the bills we saw come through the session. AB 206, which was the Renewable Portfolio Standard, and SB 392, which is Community Solar, those were both vetoed, but the Commission on Energy Choice will be looking at those. And more specifically, the working group that I chair, which is called Innovation and Technology and Renewable Energy Development, we are tasked with coming up with recommendations for integrating those two items into a new energy market. And for anyone who wants to follow the Committee on Energy Choice, you can find all the information on the Governor's Office of Energy website. You go to Programs and it'll say Committee on Energy Choice. And you can look at all the minutes, listen to all the old hearings, and be part of that process. I like the fact that Governor Sandoval obviously is friendly to the idea of clean energy. He's shown it over and over again. And the state legislature is very open to talking and getting us bills and passing legislation that benefits us as clean energy consumers. And I love the term that you used a couple of times during our discussion, bipartisan. That is a phrase that I don't hear in politics enough. No, and we are so fortunate here in Nevada to have had this relationship from both parties because there's really no question that decarbonization Carbonizing our grid is the right thing to do. We've talked about this before. Nevada has no native fossil fuels, so we import everything. So why wouldn't Nevada be working on clean energy? So for those from the progressive flank, it makes sense for the environment. For those who may be more conservative and are more concerned about the impact on the economy, it helps Nevada's economy. It's created billions of dollars of investment and tens of thousands of jobs. And Governor Sandoval really wants to see this state be a net exporter, meaning that we are sending out more to our neighbors than we are using. But he also wants us to be the leading consumer and producer of renewable energy. And as somebody who's watched this over 10 years, it is great to have someone like Brian Sandoval really leading the charge on making Nevada the innovator, the leader, the true champion of clean energy in the West and the nation. The future looks pretty darn bright when it comes to clean energy. It's a very sunny forecast here in Nevada for clean energy. Nevada is a very clean energy friendly state. It works for us. We have a lot of resources and it ends up benefiting us in the way of money and jobs. And it sounds like we're on a really positive road. Jennifer Taylor, I want to suggest that you visit us to keep us up on what's happening with clean energy in the state of Nevada because you are our clean energy expert. I appreciate that. There's really so much that is going on in Nevada in terms of clean energy work at the city level, at the county levels, at the state 
state level, at the corporate level with individuals. And so I really think that that would be fantastic, Terry. And I'm looking forward to having an ongoing and regular conversation with you about what the state of clean energy is in our state. I can't wait. Thank you so much for coming in to join us today on Talking Solutions. Of course, like always, all the information links and everything will be on our Talking Solutions Facebook page, along with a podcast of our discussion. Thank you, Jennifer. Come back and see us and keep us up on what's happening in Nevada with clean energy. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks for coming in. Coming up on next Sunday's Talking Solutions. Have you heard about pigs for the kids? It's been going on for a few years. Thousands of people turn out at Craig Ranch Regional Park for this yummy, fun event. We'll get all the details on next Sunday's show. And Terry Lindemann returns with Family Promise to tell us about the Cardboard City and Cardboard Carnival. It's October 7th. All the details on next Sunday's Talking Solutions. One of the big topics in the news the last few days has got to do with that big hack of Equifax. They've got to do with our credit records. And our credit expert with AM720, KDWN, is Harry Jacobs. Since the credit information on millions and millions of people has been potentially exposed, a huge percentage of us are at risk. Harry told us about the extended fraud alert that could help. So on our Talking Solutions Facebook page, we've got a link for everything you need to protect yourself. Just go to facebook.com slash talking solutions. Talking Solutions is a production of the Community Relations Department here at Beasley Media Group, Las Vegas. Get more information on today's topic on our Talking Solutions page on Facebook, where you will also find links and a podcast of today's show. Thanks for listening, and have a great week.